so uh, the, um, the aim of the series was to start a public debate around the provocative question, why poverty? Why is there poverty? Um, I've put up some facts, and I know these might be very, some of the statistics are very early on, and um, uh, we're still collecting uh, statistics, but this is just some highlights from the series. Um, so uh, 69, 70, 71 broadcasters, somewhere in that vicinity. Um, and it was launched in, uh, in New York, in the UN. Um, there were over a million YouTube views, 30,000 subscribers, 35 million tweets. These are all big statistics that you could actually find, uh, most of them actually on the Why Poverty site. There's a big um, analysis of the, of the series right now um, being undertaken uh, in South Africa. And these are very preliminary findings, um, not findings, but, but statistics. Um, in China, in the uh, social media sites, over 2.6 million um, downloaded, watched, and it's tweeted. It's been blocked now. Oh, it's being blocked? It oh. has been blocked last week, yeah. Oh, okay. Rather belatedly. <laughs> okay, well, it got <laughs> in there before the blocking. Um, <laughs> Um, these are very uh, small numbers. I, you know, I vowed never to ever show statistics um, in a presentation, but it's just what the statistics tell you is what different, ha what the viewer um, figures were in different countries on the night of viewing, not what the catch-up TV numbers were. And catch-up TV has has actually changed things and how many people watch things, of course. But, um, but one of the things to, 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 um, to note is the differences in percentages between countries. So Iceland, um, you know, films were being watched by 50%. Some films were being watched by 50% of people who were watching television that night. Um, whereas, we'll get to the UK figures, um, the Netherlands, again, very high. PBS, um, I think they just did a blanket figure at at one point um, of 47 million. Um, and that's how many people can actually access PBS, so that doesn't actually reflect the, the true figure. Um, when we get to the UK, the numbers are actually quite depressing. Uh -huh. And um, and this is, um, you know, there were many more people watching this on Catch Up TV. Uh, there were many more people watching, um, downloading these, but the night on the night of viewing, these were these were the numbers. So, um, this is something that we could talk, we will be talking about later on. Um, Denmark was <coughs> particularly interesting. Um, obviously, a very a small population relative to the UK, but a third of the people in Denmark watched the series, and that that's significant. One million people watched the. Zina Badawi um, uh, uh, debate um, with Tony Blair um, that that was that was broadcast there as well. So there's an interesting there's an interesting comparison here, um, and there are a lot of very different factors that I think we we would need to interrogate uh, further. Um, on the site, uh, the the OU actually contributed to the um, the further learning and this was always part of the this was always part of the aim of the of the series we the series was intended to inspire debate and encourage further learning and um, I can give you the the address I will give you the address of this um, after after um, some of the speakers um, have have uh, presented um, because there's a lot of very interesting uh, not only data, but in engaging uh, information. Um, so really driving this, this event today is the question, can why poverty help us better understand how to engage people around issues of poverty and inequality? Or what can we learn from why poverty? Um, uh, and then these questions, these sub-questions will be picked up um, throughout the, the discussion and the presentations. Um, so. For, uh, to start, we will start with Nick Fraser. Um, and um, I guess the, the question, I guess, well, Nick, you, you have idea, um, you have a lot of history and context, but you know, the, the engagement of, of publics and, and the numbers, I guess, are, the, are some of the key points. How long do you want me to talk from, Brent? Uh, you can <coughs> talk about 10. Okay. Um, 
I, uh, I've got a problem here because I've got two problems. Firstly, this is, this is a very grueling long-term project and we're busy doing post-mortems and when you do post-mortems, you have a tendency, I think, to be hypercritical. And the other problem I have is that I have to be totally blunt with you, I think, for my credibility about what, what the BBC got out of it and what it should have got out of it. And so I'm just warning you about that. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about the origins of the project, why I think it was distinctive and, and why I think, in spite of what Helen has indicated, it was really an enormous success. <coughs> I had um, no experience whatsoever in making films about poverty. Indeed, I had avoided making films about poverty, I, I think for two reasons. Firstly, I knew nothing about the subject. And secondly, um, more importantly, if you're like myself, a person with reportorial instincts, you have a kind of sense that there's an electric fence called NGOs. And when you approach the electric fence, if you're a clever reportorial animal, you run away in the opposite direction. Or you try to get around the fence because it spells pain and disaster. That's what reporters like me think. Um, we started Why Poverty because we'd done a global series as a prototype called Why Democracy, and I felt thoroughly at ease with the essentially comic but serious also aspects of global democracy. Um, the, the series was done in a very ad hoc way. Um, it had a website run by students out of Cape Town. It had a kind of pioneering, charming aspect, but the films did very well, and a lot of them went around the world and were seen by millions and millions of people. Um, and I think when, it wasn't my decision to get into to, to poverty, but my, my friend and colleague, Meta Hoffman, from Denmark, and I thought, well, you might as well do this. You might as well um, tear up your own rule book and get involved with something extremely difficult and treat it as a challenge. And that's basically what happened. I think I'd like to make two points about the commissioning of the films. The films were commissioned by a committee of um, broadcasters. Actually, all the work, as is usual in these things, was done by a very s small group of myself and Mella and Don Edkins, who, who's activist, campaigner, who uh, producer of non-activist documentaries too, who had started off uh, Steps for the Future about AIDS in South Africa, and he'd also, we'd all worked on that. We'd all worked on why democracy is so, so that third thing together. And when we commissioned the films, we commissioned them globally. We went for uh, directors as far as possible from all over the world. The short films have a wider spread of directors. You can, you can take a risk on short films, but when you're dealing with long films, you have to have people with a track record. But the filmmakers, um, while, while the selection didn't correspond with the right PC gender criteria, the filmmakers did, broadly speaking, come from all over the world. And the films were focused on two things. They were focused on, they would be about, they would be real films. They wouldn't be issues illustrated with pictures. As Tony Benn would say, they were, wouldn't say actually, but they were not issue films. I love the word. They were films that were real documentaries that, that actually got you into people's lives and approached subjects via the protagonists. Um, that there was, a, and we, I think, had eight subjects that were very good, either about what kept people in poverty or what got them out of poverty. And the films were to be constructed around questions. Um, the questions were good questions. And I think in, in different ways all the films were, I, I like them all. I, I think that um, Solo Mamas is a classic, uh, a film that purports to be about um, solar engineering, and it is about solar engineering. What it's actually about is the grim circumstances in which throughout a lot of the world women are consigned due to attitudes um, towards marriage and what they're supposed to do in careers. And, you know, the film could have been retitled The Stupidest Husband in the World. <laughs> and if you see this film, you will find it charming, enlightening, but harsh, too, and black. And I think that's sort of true of all the films. They balanced between hope and darkness. And I think in 20 years' time, it's the highest compliment I can give them. People can look back and say, well, that, not just that was what people thought about poverty at the time. This is what, where we were with global poverty. I think we could have commissioned another eight, ten films, but you know you have to make your choices, and that's that. The thirty films were done from Cape Town, and they are they are more um, campaigning. The, 
I'm coming on to the funding of the whole thing, but they are slightly different from the main eight broadcast films. Now, what I have to underline is that this was, um, this was the, the films were funded by broadcasters. The rest of the project, i.e. the website, whypoverty.net, which was run from London by Sophie Tennyson, and uh, the short films and the um, outreach, we were able to take money from foundations. And we had money from the Bertha Foundation, from Gates, from Ford, from the Van Leer Foundation. We had a total of uh, around about, um, I should say, $8 million. Um, and amazingly, the bit you'd be pleased to know, the BBC's, uh, well, you may not be pleased to know, the BBC got a very good deal out of this because the money from inside the BBC came from Storyville and from the Open University. So what you're talking about, you're talking about us lining up over three years, 70 broadcasters to show that. And what we're doing is we're assembling enough cash, mainly from broadcasters in the north, from America, from Canada, from Northern mm -hmm. Europe, Scandinavians generous, contribution from the BBC. And what we're then able to do is to make available for free or sell for practically nothing the films to other broadcasters throughout the world. And we, it hasn't been shown in India yet, but we have a deal with Dodeshan on the table. It was shown throughout Africa by ETV, we, and, and in the Middle East by MTV. So we had a, a sort of um, coverage throughout the world. So the, the first point to make before we get on the difficult question of Britain is that these films were by no means only seen by people involved in the aid lobby, etc. They had a really a huge audience globally. We don't know how much. We thought it might be 500 million. I don't know. I, I'd be surprised if it was less than 300 million. So you're talking about very, very large numbers of people getting access to these films. Now, the second thing we did, obviously, was to make these films available for free, uh, and we had to get all the broadcasters to agree to that through a Google channel or through our website. So they, they have a life of a year in which anyone who wants to use them, consult them, do what they like with them, can, can gain access to them. And I, I don't think that's been done before. So. I would say that was all terrific. Um, it seems to me that uh, what we built was some prototype. Um, you know, what the part of the prototype was the way broadcasters could combine, um, foundations um, could give money to broadcasters through the device of Steps International, this non-profit organization that commissioned the film. And out of that, you get sort of multiple synergies. You get everything working together. Um, so what do I have to say about Helen's um, rather difficult to answer questions? I think um, we reached a very large audience globally. Um, I think we circumvented to some degree um, the question of whether television is the best way to communicate such matters. I mean, the answer to that is that the status of television is wildly different in different cultures all over the world. Television has become one of the least relevant means of um, you know, communicating serious ideas in the United States, where it's primarily an education media. And there you have to work online because there's very high online penetration, etc. But I think we, we got the balance right, and these shows were seen a lot on television throughout the world. Now, I think I have to be absolutely candid with you about the BBC. I love the BBC passionately and have devoted much of my life to trying to um, work inside the BBC for organizations such or, or companies such as independent producers outside the BBC. And sometimes, you know, working at the BBC is, is like cohabiting with a skittish elephant when you you have no idea when it's going to sit, sit on you, basically. You, you hope that it will do what it's supposed to do and not take three steps back and sit on you. And I would describe the white poverty experience as a sort of borderline elephant nearly sitting on you experience for me. Um, I mean, we had everything lined up with everyone important in the BBC, that this should be global and it should be a pan-BBC experience. And unfortunately, with about four months ago, three months ago before transmission, this sort of particular piece of paper was ripped up inside the BBC. And there were two reasons for that. One was that um, at BBC4, the decision was that the, the programs, and this was not a reflection on the quality of the programs, should be primarily a BBC4 event. That was one decision. 
And the other decision, um, or lack of decision, emerged from the sort of chaos of Jimmy Savile. Well, what does Jimmy Savile have to do with international development? Well, nothing. But when you have an organization like the BBC that is, um, you know, n in normal times, remorselessly comp competent, you will observe that when things happen to it, like Jimmy Savile, a great panic sets in. And unfortunately, the uh, why poverty moment coincided with the great Jimmy Savile panic. And it became impossible to get a sort of coherent view out of what should be done with these programs. So I have to say, I think, um, against my wishes, the programs under, this is acknowledged in the BBC, underperformed domestically on the BBC. But against this, you have to set two things. Um, I offer two areas of hope. Firstly, the programs were taken and shown by BBC World News with quite astonishing success. They reckon that up to 40 million people watched each of the shows globally. So you're, when you're talking about global reach, the BBC world, through World News was actually the primary mover in the whole project. Um, the other thing you know, which I, I give to you, you may start snickering before I get the end of it, is that the consequences internally of um, white poverty would seem very good. Firstly, in the reshuffle of the BBC, there is at last Roger Mosey is now in charge of pan BBC events. So if we were encountering um, this again, um, there will be someone I could go to and I'd say, look, this is crucial. It has to be a pan BBC event. I, I wouldn't have to rely on Mark Thompson, who unfortunately, um, th the month that he would have had to keep it as a pan BBC event had gone to the New York Times. Um, the other thing that is totally fascinating for me is that one of the, the most bizarre aspects of this whole career was my initiation into the mysteries of regulatory policy regarding third-party funding. Um, translated into real English, this means um, can the BBC take money from organizations such as the Ford Foundation? And um, I, I, I went to lunch with the person, David Jordan, who's in charge of all this. And it, and it is certainly the case that um, you know, the BBC are now very interested in the experience of um, Steps International. Steps International um, was a very, was an interesting prototype. It, it is a means whereby you can set up an independent organization, people give money to the independent organization, you have an independent editorial board, and you can, you can separate the money from its consequences. And I have a project which has been approved by the BBC now, which I'm looking for money for, which I think would transform um, the idea of films about the developing world, or whatever you call it, on media. And that is the BBC World News are now happy to have between 20 or 30 documentaries a year. It is absolutely appropriate for us to find outside money for this, and I'm starting to do this. And the money can come from sponsorship, uh, because BBC World News has slightly different rules than the rest of the BBC, or it can come from foundations. So to sum up, you know, whatever disappointments we had over the domestic transmission within the BBC, I think they will be more than made up for by the impact of the series on the future consideration of such projects within the BBC. Thank you, Nick. And um, yes, I mean, doing a post-mortem is, is never, is, it doesn't give you the full picture. And I completely agree that, you know, the figures were disappointing in the UK of people watching, but actually this is, and the reason it was so disappointing is because it's such a good series. So I would encourage you to yeah. watch it. Um, it's such a good series and I haven't seen anything quite like it before. And I think the, the, it does set a, a, a standard for the way that, that um, broadcasters... I mean, I, ho I hope they uh, will be repeated or some of them at the time yeah. of the G8 summit. And they're going on BBC World News again at the time of the G8 summit, where let's hope they get another huge audience. So, you know, that's not so bad, really. No, and actually, the, you know, the, the, the figures that I'm showing you are just um, a tiny percentage of the people that have watched it. So it, it can be very deceptive to look at statistics like that. The reason I brought the statistics in was to look at, you know, to, to kind of open a light, to shed some light on whether, you know, what's different in Denmark than in the UK? Why were they received in a different way there? What's different in other countries compared to, to say, the UK? And, and what can we learn from that? Um, and it's not necessarily what can we learn from that 
in making these documentaries, but in the way that we treat them. Um, I mean, do you, do you want me to talk briefly about that? I was, I was very, look, in general, the more efforts that broadcasters put into the series, the more they got out of it. And actually, um, SVT, Swedish Television, um, when they did Wide Democracy, they put a fantastic amount of effort in it, and it worked fantastic well for them. They were slightly less good last time. So I'm saying this because, however, I do think among the list of things we could learn from Scandinavia is don't be so timid mm -hmm. when it comes to public policy. Don't, don't, don't <coughs> think if you're discussing global poverty, there's something vaguely shameful about it. Because the, the great thing that happened in, in Denmark, which is partly a result of the personality of Meta Hoffman, but also, you know, I mean, I find myself sitting on panels with development minister. I, I was speaking at launches where the director general of DR showed up and the degree of total commitment to the project by DR and, and the whole Danish setup, the whole Danish establishment, is quite remarkable. Here, you're always told, maybe you shouldn't go to the Foreign Office or DFED, maybe th there's something wrong in any collaboration between um, NGOs, DFED, broadcasters, as if they have to be kept separate. And I've got to emphasize this. The only thing that really needs to be kept separate is, is at the funding and conception level. You, you must never allow broadcasts to be turned into campaigns or into um, agitprop, in my view. That's the, the job of the BBC is to stop that. When the shows are done, you must embrace everyone. You must say the purpose of these shows is to create debate. Therefore, anyone who wants to take part in the debate, including government, should do. And I think this is a, this is a kind of trench or fence that we in Britain have to get over. We have to get adult about this. We have to get less prissy about standing off from each other and, and get into these debates more and not be ashamed of it. And I don't think we should say to each other, well, it's difficult to do this because the Daily Mail may not like this. I, I, I have the highest respect for myself, myself the Daily Mail. I always read on the plane when I go BA. But, you know, <laughs> we're, we're talking, you know, we're talking about issues that affect all the world that actually everyone in Britain cares about, most of all our Prime Minister, who as you know, is one, one of the idealistic things of his, um, his prime minister, premiership, whatever you think of what, what the outcome has been, has been to involve us and him much more in these questions. And we can feel free in reflecting all that. Thank you, Nick. Um, just uh, to remind everyone, the, um, the hashtag, if you're tweeting, is um, hash why poverty. Um, so um, I'm going to ask the panelists if they have any comments and then we can open I have a question already from an online uh, viewer but um, we'll open up Simon do you have anything well I'm, I'm when I when I talk very briefly I'm going to be talking and reflecting on on diffid and why diffid is talking about poverty and engaging the public in a very specific way but I'm interested from your perspective and actually from Lenny's perspective on what it is about the poverty debate that that makes the BBC nervous, that oh makes I, it skittish. I, so what, what, it, what is it from your perspective that? that... Well, the BBC um, regarded itself as burnt by the experience of Make Poverty History. There were two instances where essentially during a live concert, and believe it or not, during the Vicar of Dibley, when the BBC became <coughs> part of the advocacy rather than um, describing the advocacy or, or acting as ringmaster for the advocacy. Now, you may think these are like items of medieval theology, but actually they're not within the BBC. And I think this was a scarring um, experience for the BBC. It may seem very obscure to you, but there are um, numerous papers about that. I've read over 120 pages about these two episodes ep that were commissioned by the BBC Trust. And I do think, to give the BBC its due, and I, I endorse this totally, I think... I. I wonder myself why that comic relief isn't actually a propaganda. I mean, I think we, um, we adhere to stricter standards. It was easier because we were dealing with a more niche project. But I, I, do think, I do think broadcasters should not pump out propaganda. And I think the distinction in the whole context of global poverty between what is reporting and what is propaganda is extremely difficult to make. Lenny Mark, do you have any comments? Um, oh, I've got so much to say. <laughs> um, well, first of all, Nick, thank you for being so candid. It's very refreshing to hear the inside story of how something is set up and it's all in place and you have a plan and it all goes horribly wrong. Because I think 
from the outside, that is how it appeared. Um, I'd just like to, I think, for the moment, pick up a couple of points that Nick mentioned. First of all, is television the best way to engage an audience with this issue? Um, it's, ver it's a very appropriate question. Um, television is the certainly the best way to reach large audiences. And from all the research that we've done um, with audiences, people tell us that most of their information about poverty and global issues comes from television. Uh, so somehow we have to crack television. Uh, we can't just go online because the people who are going online have al are already interested. So I think the challenge for television is how do you go beyond the audience that is already interested? Um, and what we found is, first of all, where you place it is so important. And we've seen that from your viewing figures. Uh, the best film, Solar Mamas, was on BBC Four and it had less than a 1% audience share. A less good film, um, which you're calling here uh, Welcome to the World, but was shown on BBC One with a different title, um, for, for Born Every, for born every Second, second um, had uh, a 9% share. So simply where you place it, um, has a huge impact on how many people watch. I, I'd be nervous about these percentage shares. I, I'm only interested in numbers. I, 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 I don't know why okay, people well ever well talk we can about shares. You know. If you can put yeah. the slide back up, we can, we can look yeah. at the numbers. But, but you're but absolutely right. Uh, I, by the way, I don't think... Um, I think it was a very you're good show. You're, 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 Welcome to the World is a very good show, by the way. It's not a necessarily less good, <laughs> it just does different things. Yeah. Well, well, I think then we move on to how you deal with this issue, these issues and um, do you deal with it head on, uh, like Welcome to the World, where you throw lots of statistics at people, or do you deal with it through a human story like Solar Mamas? And the audiences tell us, uh, and I, I'm like that myself when I'm watching, that to be drawn into human drama and then to discover the reality of life and poverty, as Solar Mummers did, is the way to reach audiences. To tackle something head on and throw statistics at you puts, al puts audiences off. Uh, 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 and that, that, and that's, that's a truth that we have to come to terms with. Lenny, do you have any? If I can, I'd just like to sort of pause for a moment because I think we've delved already into discussing some of the intricacies of scheduling and, and challenges of internal um, um, dynamics within the BBC and actually what we haven't done is to congratulate Nick and yes. the team and the Why Poverty series for what I thought was actually a very groundbreaking approach to covering these issues. Um, I think it comes at a time when we know that public support for aid and development here in the UK is steadily declining and there are, there are plenty of reasons which are contributing to that including our own financial uh, crisis and climate um, but I think part of what it also reflects is people are switching off and they're turned off um, and by the way aid issues are, have been and continue to be communicated to them thus far and actually we've done some research last year um, doing deliberative workshops with UK citizens around the country and what came through very, very clearly is that citizens are actually rather fed up with, a, with what they see to be a very narrow story of sort of aid saves lives. You know, aid is, is the perfect solution to these problems overseas and all we need to do is to give a bit more and we'll get there. And I thought that there are there's some really important things we should take from this series. I thought, first of all, it, it gave us a very different picture of these issues from very different perspectives. Um, you know, it looked at the issues of multinational corporations um, and Zambia and the extent to which actually, you know, it's not just that, that we in rich countries give aid to those in poor countries, actually we're also benefiting, parts of our, of our own societies are benefiting from underdevelopment um, 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 in fairly exploitative ways. Um, it looked at issues of inequality, at the systemic and structural challenges um, which continue to um, 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 sort of lead to underdevelopment. And it did look at the aid debate in an interesting way. It delved down. I mean, I think the, uh, 
correct and what I understood from your figures, give us the money um, 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 gets a fairly, you know, um, sort of medium-sized share of, of, of it got, of it got interestingly, it got the same audience again, i.e. very high on the internet. Okay. So you'd mm -hmm. have to double that audience. And it got, an, as you might imagine, an astonishingly high rating in Ireland. And for those who, um, who um, perhaps need, to need reminding, what that um, show did is it looked at um, the role of celebrities in the aid debate and specifically tracked and traced through experiences of Bono, of Bob, Bob Geldof, from the li original sort of li live aid um, to the present. And actually it was a very thoughtful reflection of both the sort of the optimism in the 1980s of campaigning on these issues um, through to actually a, a, a kind of an in-depth reflection of what was over-promised, um, um, of, of actually um, um, uh, the sort of the, the challenges that, that those celebrities have faced in, in the sort of more simplistic story that they've been a part of telling. And from our own research with UK citizens, we certainly saw, going around last year talking to different groups, that this kind of shadow of, lie of live aid looms large in people's psyche in terms of what they still envisage aid and development issues to look like. And I think it very well, it kind of very, um, in very important ways, put a, put a spotlight on that and, and on some of our own um, contributions to that. So I just wanted to sort of congratulate the team. Um, I think one thing for us all to think about are some of the questions around, you know, do we still continue to communicate to the converted, if you like, to the relatively engaged audiences, whether they're in our own countries or internationally, and not to the large majority of our populations who actually are, are, are fairly un uninterested or unengaged thus far in these issues. Um, I also think it's interesting to think about, about uh, I think we may have a number of you from NGOs in the audience, but, but, but I'm interested to know why, uh, why NGOs didn't pick up and use some of these, some of these shows more in their own say campaign. NGOs in this country that didn't pick up okay. and use the shows from Sweden. You need the mic, you need the mic. So a colleague was just um, um, reminding us that I think it was uh, NGOs in this country that didn't pick up, but in others in Sweden and so on they did. But I think we have a big campaign this year, the IF campaign, which is a joint campaign across a number of NGOs. And I think it's a question back to the audience, really, to tell us why, why they weren't picked up more. Thank you, Lenny. Um, thank you, Lenny. Um, yeah, just to, you know, just to kind of uh, support what Lenny was saying, this, I think, this series, uh, the way that people were presented in this series was was admirable, and I think the way that the issues were presented in the series was admirable. The very nature of the question that's being asked leads one to look at structural causes of poverty, and it's not just about about campaigning, and um, not that there's anything wrong with campaigning, but it's not just about giving people money, it's looking deeply at the issues. Um, and actually, I, I think this, this series could have only been made by broadcasters, actually. Um, because of the because of the nature of of the way that the aid agency uh, the aid um, uh, industry uh, operates, um, I have a question from someone online. But I'm also going to open up the floor to questions and comments. Um, if you when you do have a comment and a question or a question, um, please state your name and your affiliation. And um, can we start with that gentleman over there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Greg Barrow from the World Food Programme. A question to Nick, actually. Do you think, um, based on this experience, the BBC would commission a similar series again? Uh, and, and then the follow-up to that, really, would you want to be involved if it was commissioned huh. again? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I think the BBC would and will. And um, myself, I, wh what I want to see is some... Into, I want to transform these shows from prototypes into things that are institutionally acceptable because, <coughs> frankly, the only way that these things have any long-term survival and traction is if that happens. I, I think I like to take a break from the subject, and indeed I've been commissioning films about rather different things like Pussy Riot and the comedian Richard Pryor. But I, I really do believe that this is, this is a good way of doing things, and... We just have to do it better. And I look, I, I have to emphasize this. I don't want to be I don't want to be too down on the BBC because actually 
although I would have wanted things to be better, it, it wasn't a disaster. It's, it's just that you, you kind of think, not from my point of view, but from your point of view, that if you're going to address this subject, you ought to do it perfectly. And it's quite difficult to do it perfectly. I'm sorry if that sounds feeble. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm going to read a question um, that's come in from Pauline, who's a member of the public in Buckinghamshire and is a retired public servant. And she says, great work, great resources, why so poorly promoted in the BBC in the UK? I think this is kind of touching on what we've been talking about. We know so many who didn't know the series was on or who couldn't find the rest of the series, which was out of line of sight. So I think that's... Well, in just, the just say to poor Pauline that I'm very sorry. <laughs> well, and <laughs> maybe it's not your responsibility to be, no, that, to be doing that. You, sometimes so. you have to apologize for things you didn't do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, your, your name and your affiliation. Uh, Paddy Golder, Ox, Oxford Global Media. I, I think what I'm getting here is schizophrenia about the project. It seems to be a phenomenal international success, and yet domestically here um, it, it was marginalized. Uh, I, sorry, I, I don't, that sounds overly negative. I was involved in the Frontline Club, and I know that there have been several debates there, and so it did generate very good stuff. But it does, this is a question really maybe more for Mark, but um, because it, we've got a situation where the BBC, under the Charter, has obligations in it, um, on its mainstream channels, BBC One and BBC Two, to reflect international issues. And here we are with uh, a BBC Four, largely. Uh, is this situation tolerable? Do we need to be actually much more strident with the BBC? N Nick's in a very difficult position. He's doing what he can internally. But this surely is quite unacceptable that you can have a situation in Denmark and Scandinavia and whatever where this, where this is mainstream and yet here in Britain, if our public service, we know what's happened with ITV, Channel 4 is very disappointing, but surely BBC must be held to higher standards. Yeah, I absolutely agree. As you know, Paddy, we lobbied at the time of the BBC Charter and one of the purposes is to bring the world to the UK. We have lots of conversations with commissioners and controllers. I mean, the thing is, there's a lot of people at the BBC trying hard to find ways of reaching mainstream audiences with international issues. I and mean, we, we had a session for IBT members with the editor of Panorama yesterday. Uh, he's a committed internationalist. Um, and his view is that at the right moment, uh, an international program, if it gets talked about and you can generate interest, will get a big audience. He cited North Korea, which had Panorama's highest audience for 10 years, um, almost 6 million on the night watching live, and 850,000 on catch-up. And he also said what's interesting for him as editor of Panorama is that you can see when people are watching and they're finding it interesting, they're tweeting, and the viewing figures go up while people are tweeting. Uh, 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 and uh, on, on BBC Two, uh, what, what, what commissioners are trying to do is they're smuggling in the issue of poverty through formats. So you've got a format like the toughest place to be, a taxi driver or a firefighter. British firefighter goes to the Amazon and works with a firefighter there. And you just get real graphic insight into people's lives. And that gets a bigger audience. Uh, so the, the, view, the general view from most commissioners at the BBC is if you want to look at poverty, you don't say, here's something about poverty. I don't agree with that. Uh, Nick, I'm just, no. uh, I'm, I'm reflecting what people I know, are telling that's the, the problem is that's me. what they always say. And what well, I tell I you what Actually, happens. can no. I finish, Nick, because yeah. you, you said a lot. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to say um, that. <laughs> uh, 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 and I think what's interesting, and, and I, I do commend uh, Nick, and, the, and, and, and I thought that Lenny's checklist of running through the programs and what they did was a very helpful reminder of how they tried to show that poverty is, I, I, is not a simple problem. There are causes of poverty. I think what's admirable about what Nick did is he departed from the consensus that most commissioners have of smuggling this issue in. Uh, he, 
he tackled it head on. He called the season Why Poverty? Uh, and others would have said, well, if you call it Why Poverty, you're going to put people off because, oh, it's worthy. Oh, I'm not really interested in that. Um, but, but on the other hand, he didn't get the buy-in to market it and give it the profile and get it talked about. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'm sure if Solar Mummers was at 9 o'clock on BBC One and, and we heard one of the women being interviewed on the Today programme and Twitter was going mad about this woman and the NGO community championed her and there was a lot of noise. I mean, North Korea isn't a great parallel because there was kind of noise for the wrong reasons, but if you can generate noise, people will watch something that they weren't going to watch. And the beat, you know, as the editor Panorama told us, people come off EastEnders and they start watching Panorama, and if they're interested, they stay with it. And this is the great thing about television, whereas the BBC Four, it's appointment of view. You don't just stick on BBC Four and watch whatever comes along. You go and find it. So I, th I, I, I think it's admirable that Why Poverty had a completely different approach, which is we're unashamedly going to deal with poverty and we're going to try and bring an audience. Uh, and I agree with Nick, it's, it's, a, it's a great starting point. But if the BBC did this again next time, would there be more buy-in? And, and I agree with you, Paddy, that we need to put pressure on, on, on BBC bosses to stick their necks out occasionally. Do you want to say something um, briefly? Yeah, I, I don't want to talk too much. I, I, I agree with everything <laughs> you say, basically, about these, the panorama and EastEnders. But in fact, there's a kind of middle area where I think you, I learned you can do much more. The, the, the really interesting people I met, or whose work I met in relation to global poverty, are there are three of them. There's Esther Duflo, and she'll get a Nobel Prize soon. She runs the MIT Poverty Lab. There's Jeffrey Sachs, who as I really liked as a person. You know, he's a really, I mean, he's a really sort of creative liberal economist. And of course, the father of everything, Amartya Sen. And between them, th these people have done two things. Firstly, they, they have transposed the, the human rights debate. The, the idea of what is tolerable or acceptable for circumstances that people live, what, what are rights, into the area of poverty is really, really, really important. And the second thing they've done is that they've established that there isn't one way of people getting out of poverty. There are a myriad ways. And it seems to me that I, I did a show, by the way, that got huge audiences for Radio 4, that you call Poor Reporting. I, I was very proud of it. I was very happy to do it. Anyway, never mind about that. I interviewed Farid Zakaria. Who, a man I never met, and I, you, sometimes you hit people at the right time, he was between, anyway. He said that he, he was, he's probably unique in being a member of the global media elite, who, when he was a child, had ex some experience of poverty, because his father was a politician in rural India. And he said, well, the really interesting thing about poverty these days is we know what the policies are. We actually know how to pull, one way or another, millions and millions of people out of poverty. And there's, there's, there's no argument about this anymore. There's no Daily Telegraph view. There's none of that. The question is really how you get people to understand if it is possible, um, not how it can be done, but how, how, how you want it to be done. And here he said, he was very flattering about why poverty. He said that what you have to do is depict the lives of poor people and tell people that their lives, the lives of poor people are far from boring. The life of a poor person is more eventful than the life of Donald Trump. And I thought that was very funny and very pertinent. Um, and then he said, well, the problem is obviously when you start to do that, um, their lives become, on the mass media, indistinguishable from our lives. So quite often by describing their lives, you end up by having the reverse effect, the one you intended. I thought that was very smart too. But I guess what I'd say is there's a huge area where you can make good, intelligent films, which, which are about poverty. Welcome to Lagos, definitely about poverty, a brilliant report. Um, done by my hero Paul Mason about a slum in the Philippines on Newsnight. I, I watched it transfixed as to how good he was at describing the economics of poor people in the Philippines. And we don't do enough of this. This is like not smuggling things in. It's actually appealing to people as adults to look at other people's lives 
in a context where you do talk about poverty, you get people to, to internalize these ideas and think about the whole subject in a different way. And I think that's the way forward. Yeah, Sorry, I, I, I really think we have to put broadcasters on the spot. Welcome to Lagos. Welcome <coughs> to India is a, is a great example. Interesting, that, that development was commissioned by Channel 4, and at the last moment they didn't have the courage to show it because they didn't think people would watch it. So BBC Two picked it up, and of course, you know, it won BAFTAs. There's just a, a real conservatism uh, from broadcasters not willing to stick their necks out and take risks. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, for some more questions. I think there was one here. and.